In this online presentation, we'll be discussing cerebral vascular accidents, otherwise known as strokes. The contents of this presentation will include an introduction into CVAs with some statistics from Australia and around the world, the different types of CVAs that occur, what a TIA is, the signs and symptoms to look out for in a patient who may be having a CVA or a TIA, the pre-hospital assessment, different conditions that can mimic a CVA, the pre-hospital management, and then we'll finish off with a public awareness educational video. Here we have some facts and statistics regarding CVAs. A stroke or a CVA is the second most common cause of death after heart disease in Australia. One in every six people will have a stroke within their lifetime. And in 2015, there was more than 50,000 new and reoccurring strokes in Australia. That equates to 1,000 strokes every week and one stroke every 10 minutes. It's a very common disorder which paramedics are faced with regularly. It's important that we understand how to pick up the signs and symptoms very rapidly, how to manage the patient appropriately and transport them to the appropriate health facility for further care. So strokes historically were only happening in elderly patients that were generally already within nursing homes and because there was very little known about strokes and how they could be managed and treated, not much was done for these patients. However, strokes are becoming more and more prevalent in the younger populations and in 2012 there were nearly 130,000 patients that had strokes under the age of 65. 30% of the population of patients having strokes were all of a working age and you can understand how that could affect the economics of a country, less people in the workforce, less people contributing to, to tax and because of the high disability rate that occurs with strokes, these patients would now be on a disability pension and actually costing the government lots of money. Strokes kill more women than breast cancer does, and they kill more men than prostate cancer does. 65% of those living with a stroke also suffer a major disability that impedes their ability to carry out normal daily activities unassisted. Most patients that suffer a stroke will require some assistance from a carer. In 2012, the total financial cost of stroke in Australia was estimated to be $5 billion. As you can see, this has a significant effect on the burden of health. So it's very important that there are public awareness programs that more people are getting tra trained in recognizing a stroke, managing a stroke, and rapidly move these patients to hospital to get treatment. This would dramatically reduce the level of disability that most of the survivors of CVAs would have and also would reduce the impact on the health system. A stroke is a medical emergency characterized by an acute neurological injury. This results from a sudden disruption of blood flow to the brain, either caused by a blockage within the artery or caused by spontaneous bleeding of a blood vessel within the skull. There are two types of strokes, ischemic and hemorrhagic. The first one we're going to have a look at is the ischemic stroke. An ischemic stroke is a result of an acute blockage to an artery in or around the brain. It accounts for 80% of all strokes and the causes include things such as a thrombus, an emboli and hypoperfusion, which is the most uncommon cause. So first having a look at a thrombus. Now a thrombus is the formation of a blood clot within a blood vessel. The most common cause of a thrombus is the disease process called atherosclerosis. Atherosclerosis is a chronic condition in which there's ever-increasing fat deposits within the blood vessel lining. As this fat deposit builds up and up over time, it forms what's called a, a fatty plaque. As you can see in the diagram over here, the formation of this fatty plaque progressively reduces the amount of blood flow that actually goes through that blood vessel. Over time, there can be rupturing of the fatty plaque, and when this occurs, this initiates the clotting cascade within the blood vessel. So the blood vessel sees it as a direct injury to itself, and it goes through the processes of coagulation in aid of trying to fix what it sees as an injury to the inside of the vessel. 
However, when this happens, a blood clot forms within the vessel and completely occludes this vessel and stops blood flow and causes hypoperfusion to the tissues of the brain. An emboli can be any foreign material, but is most commonly a blood clot, which arises from some other part of the body that gets transported through the bloodstream and gets lodged in the smaller vessels of the brain. One of the most common causes of an emboli in an ischemic stroke is resulting from a condition called atrial fibrillation. Atrial fibrillation is a condition in which the atria of the heart are fibrillating and they are not pushing blood out of the heart effectively. This blood that sits in the atrial chambers may become stagnant at some point and when blood becomes stagnant, it coagulates and forms a blood clot. Then when this blood clot finally gets moved through to the ventricles, it gets pushed out through the ventricles and straight up the carotid arteries and gets lodged in the brain in one of the smaller vessels. Cerebral emboli can also result from fatty plaque buildup within the arteries that get disrupted or ruptured. That fatty plaque then enters the circulation and gets lodged in one of the smaller vessels of the brain. The less common causes of an embolic stroke are things like a fat emboli, emboli arising from intravenous drug use or a septic emboli. Hypoperfusion is the most uncommon cause of an ischemic stroke and as you can imagine with a thrombus or an emboli that it's blocking a specific blood vessel, hypoperfusion is happening diffusely over the brain so it can come with more severe signs and symptoms. And hypoperfusion can result from conditions such as extreme heart failure or cardiogenic shock. Cerebral injury from an ischemic stroke is directly related to the lack of blood supply to the brain. This is most commonly caused by a complete blockage of the blood vessel. The tissue directly perfused by that blood vessel become ischemic and as neurons are highly dependent on a continuous supply of oxygen and nutrients and glucose, when the blood flow is interrupted like this, they die within a few minutes. However, there is some collateral blood supply which can provide some perfusion to the surrounding area of the ischemic tissue. Hemorrhagic strokes are a result of a burst blood vessel or a bleed on the brain. Hemorrhagic strokes account for approximately 20% of all strokes worldwide and roughly about 60% of these are fatal. They have much higher mortality rates than those of ischemic strokes and are much more difficult to manage. They can be caused by things such as hypertension, burst aneurysms, vascular malformations, tumors of the brain, and less commonly due to traumatic injuries of the neck or the head. Cerebral injury occurs due to an increased intracranial pressure as a result of a bleed on the brain or around the brain. There's local compression of the tissues and local compression of the blood vessels feeding those tissues, resulting in hypoperfusion. There are two different types of hemorrhagic CVAs. One is a subarachnoid hemorrhage, and this is often precipitated by a sudden onset of severe headache. Patients often call it a thunderclap headache, which comes on very, very rapidly, and it's debilitating, causes nausea and vomiting. Or it could be an intercerebral bleed, so within the actual tissues of the brain. A TIA or a transient ischemic attack is often known by the public as a mini stroke. TIAs are caused by a temporary blockage to a cerebral artery resulting in ischemia. TIAs were previously defined as any cerebral dysfunction which resolved in less than 24 hours. However, it has now been redefined as cerebral dysfunction where all signs and symptoms resolve in less than one hour. Any signs or symptoms that last more than one hour to 24 hours is considered to be a stroke. TIAs have an incredibly high risk of becoming strokes. In fact, 40% of all patients that experienced a stroke had a TIA within the previous 24 hours. So please ensure that all patients experiencing a TIA are taken to hospital for further assessment and management to try and prevent a stroke from happening. The 2011 National Stroke Audit in Australia found these risk factors in patients who were admitted to the stroke care unit. 73% of all patients experiencing a stroke had high blood pressure. 50% of these had high blood cholesterol. 40% of all patients had a previous stroke or a TIA. 36% of them had atrial fibrillation. 
33% had a recent ischemic heart disease or an acute myocardial infarction. 31% were current or past smokers. 30% of these patients had diabetes. 14% had high alcohol consumption. 9% had a history of rheumatic or other vulvar heart diseases. Due to the sensitive nature of the brain, any changes in oxygen or glucose levels will result in a rapid onset of signs and symptoms. These signs and symptoms can include things such as a decreased level of consciousness, a headache, confusion or disorientation, a facial droop, visual disturbances. This may result in a decrease in the field of vision or double or blurred vision. And when you're doing your assessment, you may notice that there would be unequal pupil sizes or sluggishly reactive pupils. The patient may have slurred speech because of paralysis to parts of the tongue and the pharynx, difficulty in swallowing, and loss of the gag reflex. Very commonly in strokes, patients experience hemiparalysis, which is paralysis of one half of the body, so one side, so either left or right. What happens is, is when a stroke occurs in one portion of the brain, this results in signs and symptoms on the opposite side of the body. For example, right-sided strokes or strokes that occur in the right hemisphere of the brain result in signs and symptoms on the opposite side of the body, so occurring on the left side of the body. And if there is a stroke on the left hemisphere of the brain, it will also result in signs and symptoms on the opposing side of the body. So in this case, it would be the right portion of the body. Now, this may or may not result in complete paralysis, but there would definitely be neurological deficits on the opposing side of the body. So the patient may describe feeling heavy in the limbs or that they didn't have enough power or strength in those limbs. And you would pick that up in your assessments. It's quite common for patients that have a stroke to experience a seizure due to the neurological insult in the brain. And brainstem strokes are quite unique in that they may present with somebody experiencing nausea and vomiting and in particular vertigo. And they have major field of vision disturbances. So they often describe it feels like somebody's pulled a blind halfway down their eyes and they can only see the bottom portion of everything that they look at. These are the most common signs and symptoms that somebody may, might experience with a CVA or a TIA. However, it is not limited to these. Because depending on what part of the brain has been affected, this will result in different types of neurological presentations. When assessing the patient with a suspected TIA or a CVA, follow your systematic approach of checking your DRS ABCD. Make special note to any changes in the patient's level of consciousness or GCS and assess the ample history. Allergies, any medications the patient is on, any past medical history, particularly any previous episodes of TIA and CVA, and any predisposing risk factors for a stroke. Ask about the last oral intake and the events leading up to this. In the secondary assessment, look firstly at the patient's face. Watch for any facial asymmetry or any drooping of the face. A good thing to do is ask the patient to smile. When the patient smiles, this will exaggerate paralysis on one side of the face so that you can see it very, very clearly. And look particularly around the nasolabial fold, the fold in the face when someone smiles running from the nose to the corner of the mouth. This is going to be exaggerated in the side of the face that there's no paralysis on, and it may look very flat in the side that there is paralysis on. Assess the patient's eyes and the field of vision. So also look for any eyelid droop on one side, a wandering eye. Assess the pupils to see what size they are and how reactive they are to light. And also assess the patient's field of vision. To assess for further facial paralysis, you can ask the patient to say something that's quite difficult to articulate, such as, you can't teach an old dog new tricks. If the patient is unable to say this, there's a very high chance that they're having a stroke. And if there's anything such as slurred speech, drooling from the mouth, or an inability to swallow, this can all indicate a stroke as well. Just be very cautious of the patients that are drooling and are unable to swallow. They are at high risk of aspiration, so you may need to provide some basic airway management and suction. When assessing the extremities of the patient, we're gonna check the arms and the legs for any form of neurological damage. 
So we can ask the patient to grab hold of our hands, squeeze both our hands as hard as they can, and you're checking and comparing one side to another. Ask the patient to lift up against your hands, to push down against them, to push out and to push in. And this is going to give you a really good idea of the strength and capability of those arms. Do the same thing for the legs. Ask the patient to push their feet against your hands, up, down and out to the sides and in towards them. And this is again going to give you a good idea of what kind of neurological damage there is to the legs. Another test you can do for assessing the arms and is ask the patient to lift their arms up to eye level and hold them out in front of them. Some patients may not be able to even do this. They would only be able to lift one arm up and their other arm might not even reach the same level. If they are able to lift both arms to the same level, ask the patient to close their eyes and watch for one arm drifting away. This is also a very, very clear sign of that hemiparalysis. Paramedics can use stroke assessment systems such as the FAST mnemonic. This is a very widely used mnemonic for the recognition and management of strokes. So F stands for facial weakness, so can the person smile, does their mouth or their eye droop down? A is for arm weakness, ask the person can they raise both arms? S is for any speech difficulty, is the person speaking clearly, can you understand what they say or is there any slurred speech? Time is to act fast. Seek medical attention immediately and call for an ambulance. This fast mnemonic is used in many campaigns in recognition and management of strokes. It has proven to be a very effective public awareness program, which is helping people recognize a stroke rapidly and seeking medical attention immediately. The last thing to note is that you cannot discern between an ischemic and a hemorrhagic stroke in the pre-hospital setting. The patient requires a CT scan or an MRI to be able to state whether this person is having a hemorrhagic stroke or a ischemic stroke. So the quicker we get these patients off to hospital and the quicker they get those diagnostic tests done, the faster that they can receive the definitive treatment. These are some conditions to be aware of which may mimic the signs and symptoms of a stroke. Severe alcohol intoxication, cerebral infections, a drug overdose, toxicity, hypoglycemia, head injuries, migraines, Bell's palsy with facial paralysis, a condition called Todd's paralysis which can occur after seizures, tumors of the brain, and hypotensive encephalopathy. Doing a very thorough history on your patient as well as assessing for all the signs and symptoms of a stroke are going to help you to differentiate between conditions that may mimic a stroke and the patient that is having a stroke. When it comes to pre-hospital care, our aim is to support airway, breathing and circulation. So keep the airway clear of any secretions. The patient may require some regular suctioning. Ensure that you position the patient appropriately. In the conscious patient, we should have them in a semi-reclined position and however they are most comfortable. Then for the unconscious patient, because you might be requiring to do some more advanced airway management, they will most likely be in the supine position, but we teach for anyone who is not conducting airway management to actually have this patient in the left lateral position to ensure that any oral secretions drain away and the patient does not aspirate. Provide oxygen therapy at 15 liters per minute. We want to have a high dose of oxygen for these patients. The higher concentration we have of oxygen in the blood, the higher chance of oxygen getting to that ischemic tissue via collateral blood flow. Support ventilations if this is required. Calm and reassure the patient and transport them rapidly. Time is of the essence and as time goes by, brain cells die. Just some considerations for future care. As we've mentioned already, time is of the essence. The more time that goes by where the brain is not being perfused, we have hundreds of neurons dying. Early recognition equals early treatment. When any patient arrives at the emergency department, they get triaged first, they get then assessed by a doctor, and then they have to go for diagnostic testing, such as MRI and CT scans. Once the MRI and CT scans have done and have been able to differentiate between an ischemic stroke or a hemorrhagic stroke, that will then 
determine the pathways of care for this patient. Patients which have experienced an ischemic stroke are eligible for life-saving thrombolysis. Thrombolysis is achieved by providing a medication via IV, which will then dissolve any blood clots in the body. This allows for reperfusion of the ischemic cerebral tissue. Patients who have got a hemorrhagic stroke, they can undergo emergency surgery in attempt to stop the intracranial hemorrhage. So the way that we as paramedics can aid in the rapid management of these patients, like we've mentioned already, is early recognition, early administration to the ED, which will then lead on to early CT scans and diagnostic testing, and then reperfusion therapy. The current standard in Australia is that thrombolytics and fibrinolytics can only be given within three hours of onset of the signs and symptoms. So it's absolutely imperative that we ensure that that information is passed on in our handover and it's documented in our paperwork for the doctors in the hospital to refer to. It may not feel that we are doing a terrible amount for patients suffering TIAs and CVAs, but the early recognition and early management and transport of these patients is going to be life-saving and dramatically reducing their level or degree of disability. To conclude this presentation, we're going to be finishing off with an educational video, which is part of one of the public awareness programs to inform people about how strokes occur, how to recognize them rapidly, and what treatments are available. Hello, in this health sketch we want to talk to you about stroke. It's a bit of an odd name, stroke. It certainly has nothing to do with tennis strokes, swimming strokes, or brush strokes. The word stroke comes from the idea of receiving a strike or blow, as that is how quickly strokes appear. All of a sudden, people are struck by this illness. Did you know that every year more than 15 million people worldwide have a stroke? Of these, 5 million die and another 5 million are left disabled. Whilst most strokes occur in people over the age of 65, they can occur in much younger people too. But what exactly is a stroke? The brain, like all parts of the body, needs oxygen, which it gets from the blood. A stroke happens when blood flow to the brain is cut off. When brain cells are starved of oxygen, they become damaged and the symptoms that follow are called a stroke. As the brain controls the whole body, the symptoms of a stroke can be wide ranging, depending on which parts of the brain are affected. If the stroke occurs here, it would cause a drooping face, here, weakness in the arms or legs, or here, difficulty speaking. Other symptoms can happen too, like changes to vision, loss of balance, confusion, and memory loss. The effects might be barely noticeable, but are more often severe and disabling. Sometimes these changes can be reversed if treatment is started early. That's why it is so important to act quickly if you suspect a stroke. Remember, you need to get help fast. F is for face. Is their face drooping on one side? Can they smile? A is for arms. Is there weakness in the arms? Can they lift them both up? S is for speech. Is their speech slurred? T is for time. If you spot any one of these signs, then it's time to call an ambulance. Once the ambulance arrives at the hospital, a doctor will assess you and arrange an urgent scan of the head, which shows where the brain is damaged and what type of stroke has happened. Strokes are put into two groups depending on the problem in the blood vessels supplying the brain. There can either be a blockage, called an ischemic stroke, or a bleed, called a hemorrhagic stroke. The majority of strokes are blockages. It's important to identify early on which sort of stroke has happened, as they each have very different treatments. Blockage strokes are commonly caused by the buildup of fatty material in blood vessels. This fatty buildup may lead to a clot, which blocks the blood supply, just like in a heart attack. This is why a stroke can be thought of as a brain attack. A clot may occur within the brain, or it can travel from another part of the body, commonly the blood vessels in the neck. Clots can also travel from the heart, which may happen when you have an irregular heartbeat called atrial fibrillation, or AF. If a blockage stroke is detected within the first few hours, a clot-busting medication is sometimes given to dissolve the clot. This is called thrombolysis. If thrombolysis can't be used, other medications such as aspirin will be given as treatment instead. Bleeding strokes happen when a blood vessel bursts suddenly, causing blood to leak in or around the brain. In these strokes, blood on the brain can lead to swelling, a serious problem which may require surgery in some cases. 
Sometimes, stroke symptoms completely disappear in less than 24 hours. This is called a mini-stroke, or TIA. Often, symptoms only last a few minutes, but just like with a full-blown stroke, you must go to hospital immediately if you suspect a TIA. This is because a TIA is a warning sign that you're at high risk of having a full stroke. Whether you have a TIA or a full stroke, daily medications are started and continued lifelong to help prevent further episodes. The effects of a stroke can be disabling, but given time, the brain can slowly adapt to recover some previously lost abilities. This is why stroke rehabilitation is so important. Rehab can be challenging, but many specialists are on hand to help alongside doctors and nurses. If your stroke causes difficulty swallowing, dietitians can recommend special diets or feeding tubes. If you have problems with communication, speech and language therapists can help. If it has become difficult to walk or perform daily tasks, physiotherapists and occupational therapists can offer exercises and home adaptations. Also, after a stroke, people often feel low or frustrated that they can't do the things they used to and don't like being dependent on others. Counselors can help talk through these feelings and many patient groups are available for further support. We've talked a lot about strokes, but what can we do to prevent them from happening? Even if you've already had a stroke in the past, there are many small steps we can all take to reduce our future risk of having a stroke, such as lowering high blood pressure, the number one cause of stroke, Stopping smoking. Lowering cholesterol. Being more active. Eating healthily. Lowering alcohol intake to within recommended limits. If you have diabetes, keeping good control of blood sugar levels. In this health sketch, we've talked about what a stroke is, how to spot the key symptoms and the need to act fast. We've also talked about treatments, rehab, and the steps we can take to prevent strokes. We hope this health sketch about stroke has been helpful for you and those around you. Health sketch, health for all to see.